Welcome to Golf Industry Guru and the Gig Podcast, where we interview the best and brightest golf and hospitality leaders on the planet. On today's episode, you will learn some proven real-world solutions that will help you and your team solve some of your biggest golf business challenges. So stick around for some tips, tools, and training to get you, your people, and your business powered on. Here's your host, Scott Massey. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Gig Podcast. I am your host, Scott Massey, and you are back with us for another episode of the Gig Podcast. And today we're going to talk about branding, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest to you today, Mr. Gare Maxwell. Uh, Gare is a storyteller, brand strategist, and self-described history junkie who marvels at the sight and sound of a well-struck drive off the tee. A frequent flying keynote speaker, Gare has shared speaking stages with icons such as Richard Branson and Gene Simmons and was named Speaker of the Year by Tech Canada, the country's largest CEO organization. Gare is also the author of Big Little Legends, which is a book about how everyday leaders build irresistible brands, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. So with that said, Gare, welcome to the Gig Podcast. Well, it's great to be here, Scott. I've so been looking forward to through the holidays and uh, to that this podcast is the first of 2023, the opportunity to be with Classy Scott Massey, which I'm sure is not the first time you've heard that moniker. It's happened uh, it's a couple times a, for sure. Uh, it, yeah. I, I, like I say, I, I'm just uh, pumped and ready to go. Well, me too. I'm so glad that we're able to do this. Uh, we've been working on it for a little while, obviously, but uh you know, I enjoyed the book. I wanted to read it, obviously, before we connected and did this. Uh, and we're going to talk about the book today. But before that, uh, tell us a little bit about your career background and your connection to the game and the business of golf, because I think our audience will definitely want to hear about that. Yeah, that's that's a great place to start. Um, and, and, and it gives a lot of context because I'm the son of a former pro golfer. So I literally grew up. I'm the oldest of three. And I grew up at my father's knee, as it were, on a golf course as a little kid, some of the early childhood memories. So I can, I can very much relate to anyone in our audience uh, in terms of what that whole environment's like. So dad, very quick story, um, is a former pro who was born seven minutes from the first tee at St. Andrews, Scotland. And he learned the game at the old course. He comes to Canada at the age of 17 and turns professional at Lambton in Toronto. Some of his contemporaries at the time would have been legends like Gary Cowan, Mo Norman. The, they used to go down south to Florida just during the winter. You know what I mean, Scott? Just to, Absolutely. To, to play some golf, make a few bucks, enjoy the Florida sunshine as young guys. Uh, Dad was 17, 18 years old doing this. And, and he went, you know, 5,000 miles away from home to to follow his dream to turn professional. Well, then he meets my mother, settles back in Maritime Canada. And he was one of those... He would be like the big fish in the small pond. So if you added all, you know, you just add it all up from his pro days to he was gone from the game for about 15 years and then he came back. It's, but if you did all the math, you could probably make a, an argument that, yeah, dad probably won about 100 tournaments. Like, OK, what I'm telling you, Scott, he was incredibly good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had game. And it's too and bad, older, you know, the, obviously back it, in the day, the money wasn't like it is today, of but course, of course who knows not. what have been his career would have been like if, uh, yeah, if like things if, have been if different. He, yeah. If, if, if a kid with his talent comes out today, it's an, it's a completely different story, right? Absolutely. You know, like a, a one quick anecdote is, you know, he, he doesn't play for the better part of 15 years and he had to wait to get his amateur card reinstated and the rules were pretty tough back then. He he, he would have played once during a year and, and, and showed up and shot 69. You bet. Like that's, but his oldest son did not have game. I struggled with the game as a little kid. I'm six, seven years old and this dad makes it look so easy yeah, I, 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 I can't do this. And, and, and so, you know, as a, when you're a kid, you just gravitate towards the thing that's shiny and cool. And for me, it became hockey and baseball and football, the team sports. And so as a little kid growing up, 
you know, seven, eight, nine, then you get into your team. Like golf was just this thing that dad did. And it wasn't until much, much later in life. Uh, when I went back to the old course in St. Andrews in 2016, that I truly began, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but you know, I'm 55 years old and I'm starting to appreciate what my father actually did, what this game really means. Like a, it rekindled an incredible love affair with the game. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's I, that's that's kind of how it comes full circle. No, I love that, and I mean, I, you know, I love the you know the knowledge and appreciation that you have for the game and our business. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to chat with you today because uh, you can relate to what uh, club owners and operators uh, do on a day in and day out basis. But also you're, you've got some expertise in branding, which we're going to talk about. Uh, has that always been the area that you focused your career on or, or was there something else before? I think there was that you probably should share yeah, with our audience as well. Yeah, I'm a, I, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Full disclosure, I'm a recovering broadcast journalist. So I did 20 years of radio and television primarily out of the newsroom, including the toy department of the newsroom, which was the sports department. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. right. So I did sports casting for, for quite a long time. And and so um, that, and I say that so that everyone listening today understands, I don't come from programming or sales or marketing. I come from editorial. Mm -hmm. So I still approach my work with the mindset of a journalist, like a reporter. I want to know storytelling, right? The storytelling and why does why does certain things work? Like what is the most famous painting in the world Mm -hmm. and why? Mm -hmm. And 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 why did St. Andrews become this global destination that it is now? Because when my father left in 1957, Scott, there were no lineups. Yeah. No one was coming over across the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean or the Seven Seas anywhere to book tea times at St. Andrews. No, absolutely. And I know that like when did that all happen? Like like that's the kind of so for so after I left broadcasting. I got into at first small business consulting and and the long and the short of it is I got incredibly fortunate to test out uh, a number of absolutely counterintuitive theories um, that have nothing so much to do with marketing or advertising, but everything to do with, well, how do you create the legend? Yeah. Yeah. And I know we're going to dive into that a little bit. We're going to talk about St. Andrews. We're going to talk about some famous paintings or one in particular. Um, But let's talk about your book. I loved it. It was a great read. So many awesome takeaways. Um, Maybe just tell our audience a little bit about what inspired you to write the book, Big Little Legends. Well, that's a great, uh, that's a, I love that question. Um, No one's actually framed it that way before. Um, It's in chapter two. There's an origin story. Like like everything, everything's got an origin story. For the book, the actual origin story is in chapter two, and that's a real life story. Okay, um, and but but chapter one is the is kind of like the global universal truth of the whole thing. So let's kind of flip it, and our Perfect. listeners will follow along and. Because the book actually begins in Paris, France, and it begins at a museum frequented by 10 million visitors a year. And I would argue, Scott, 99% are going to see one painting and one painting alone. And you know what would be fun today? And we've never done this on a podcast. And you, What's that? you and I talked before. We were not going to rehearse anything. Yep. There are no scripted questions, Right. Just That's like right. everything about the book is very real. There's no ghost writers. This is, a, this is okay, in mm-hmm. the moment. Guess what, Scott? You and I are not even going to mention the name of the painting. But they know what it is. But anyone listening already knows what it is. So yeah. I got fascinated. Why? Why that painting? Mm-hmm. All right? And then my research, because it took me four years to write and research the book, my research pinpointed the day august 21st 1911 is when the world tilted on its axis for that one painting 
And what I noticed throughout the 12 chapters, or and what we built through the 12 chapters, was this idea of, well, when was the legend created? And then what would be the commonalities of every single legend? Right. And the origin story in chapter two, and I won't, ru- I'm trying not to ruin the read for anyone either, but I, but it's a small business guy and you know the story, right? It's a mm-hmm. small business guy and his wife. Mm-hmm. And I met Jim and Donna in 2002 and they had an interchangeable product in a highly competitive category. So let's stop right there. How many people listening today can relate? Small mom and pop business, interchangeable product, extremely cutthroat, ruthless, competitive category. Absolutely. And it could definitely be the golf the steer- business. What's that? It could definitely be the golf business for sure. It could be, yeah. right? You know? And and so, you know, how many golf courses are on planet Earth? Well, my research says 38,000. Mm-hmm, Great. Correct. But only three are bucket list destinations, right? Pebble Beach, Augusta National, and the old course in St. Andrews, like mm-hmm. unanimously. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm taking that same thought process and applying it to any category. So for me, when I met Jim and Donna in 2002, they didn't fit the stereotype of their category. And it only took us four years, and you read the story so you know uh, the the detail behind it. But the punchline is when we started telling, when Jim and Donna started telling their own story, that's Like we can pinpoint the day they were doing 1.2 million or so in annual revenue around that 1.2, 1.3 mark. We know the day in September of 2006 when everything changed and it had nothing to do with pricing or products or what are all the other business things out there, Scott? They're USPs. Come on, yeah. throw them out there. What is to- there out there? Totally. I mean, there's, you know, it's everybody's competing on price, and they're, you know, they're doing all these things that uh, really don't do differentiate themselves. Exactly. Right. We didn't. All we changed, and it was significant. I don't want to minimize it. All no, what we changed was not product pricing promotion. We nothing to do with features, advantages, benefits. We changed the story. Yeah. And he became. You know, he he comes from a category, not not only is it wildly competitive, I think from a reputation point of view, it's the worst category on planet Earth. And as soon as I say it, every listener will paint a picture in their mind. This is the beauty of doing it on audio. Totally. He sells he sells used cars. He sure does. And Scott, what's everyone picturing? You tell me, what are they picturing right now listening to us? Yeah, just unethical and sleazy and all those stereotypes that we apply to used car sales. Bad jackets, yep. uh, right? A lot of plaid, a lot of yeah. hustle, <laughs> right? And and Jim and Donna are are so kind and quiet and generous, and they're like low talkers right out of Seinfeld. And when we say we changed the story, we changed it with – um a, a, a narrative. And in chapter seven, we dive into how you build a narrative. It's it's so he became Canada's huggable car dealer and the huggable car dealer, especially for a radio audience. We went on the radio and told or an audio audience now um, on a broadcast. We went on the radio and told 30 second vignettes about he's the Casanova of customer focus. He's the Romeo of roadsters. By golly, he's the McDreamy of drive. Right. We were telling all these stories and that's when the traffic really started. The traction began. That became a $50 million enterprise. He's the largest independent used car dealer in all four Atlantic Canadian provinces. And he added power sports to the portfolio as we speak right now for the second year in a row. And he just got into the power sports game in 2018. Uh, for the second year in a row, he's the number one Kawasaki dealer in Canada out of 160 dealers. Like the wow. guy just showed up yesterday, almost. I love it. Amazing. And, and he was number two in the country in 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 2019. Then in 20, you know through the pandemic, he he took the number one spot and has set sales records for Kawasaki. Well, how did the guy just show up out of the blue? Yeah. And 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 one of the things we arrived at, Scott, and this is what. 
I think our listeners will appreciate today. Once you figure out the story and start building upon the core story, then the huggable car dealer is a perfect metaphor for anyone because it became more than just clever ads. It's, you know, it's, there's hundreds of teddy bears. At first it was dozens of teddy bears. Then it's hundreds. There's mascots. There's merry-go-rounds. It's, it's a two kilometer nature trail to go walk your dog. Like how many layers can we add Disney-like fashion to the huggable story, Scott? Yeah. It goes forever. Totally. Well, and, so, and so, so that became, it's a long way of answering, but that, that was like, so I knew for years, it was like, I've got this lab where I'm testing out, what are we trying to figure out? Yeah. We're trying to figure out how do we positively impact buyer behavior in our favor, right? And I had this lab. And, and so consequently, the book, using that story as a springboard, became the foundation for a lot of counterintuitive theories about how you can actually build the irresistible brand. Well, it's 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 so interesting to me. Like I, I'm looking forward to diving a little bit deeper with you here as we go about how to create that story. You know, yeah, giving people a compelling reason to choose you over the other options they have. And you know, I think there's a lot of similarities between you know the used car business in and the golf business in the sense that um, you know there's it's very difficult. I think sometimes to differentiate. Um, you know, from one to the other, you know, and, and what are we doing to give people that compelling reason to choose us over the other options they have? So I'm excited to talk about that a little bit further as we go. Um, but before we move uh, any further, let's talk a little bit about branding versus sure. marketing. And I just, I think it's important for you to maybe just take a minute to differentiate between branding and marketing for our audience. Cause I think that's, that's a really important point to make before we chat any further. Yeah, that, that, that's a that's a good question. Came up yesterday with a, a CEO group I was working with uh, uh, out out in Calgary, and um, so you know I think the way I he, here's the thing about the question is that you could talk to literally a hundred different marketing or brand experts, and how many different answers are you going to get? A hundred, a hundred. Yeah. Like it's just right. It's kind of like golf coaches. Everyone teaches the golf swing kind of a different way. Sure. When you it's not a standard thing, I agree. you know. And, and and so and by the way, teaching the golf swing, I believe is only slightly more complicated than understanding nuclear physics. <laughs> like if I you, do you know what I mean? The structure yeah. of the atom and breaking down Einstein's E equals MC squared, I think ranks a little bit below than the intricacies of the golf swing and mastering the golf swing. There you right? go. So from a point of view of, of, of marketing and brand, uh, I'm going to bring it back to brand, which I think is the most misunderstood, misapplied word in the business vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And so from our perspective and what we've you know written about in Big Little Legends, but most importantly, Scott, We've tested this over and over and over again in the marketplace. It begins and ends with the I word, identity. And I think a lot of companies out there, not just in the golf industry, I think it's universal. If I give you a metaphor, cart before the horse, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Right? Right away. All of our listeners know. I think identity is the real issue. Once Canada's huggable car dealer solidified its identity, then all of the marketing efforts, all of the sales things, all of the promotions, all of, you know, everything they did, the ads, the different, uh, you know, community projects they supported. To me, it begins and ends with identity. Okay. In terms of what it is, brand speaks the language of metaphor. It is a metaphorical language. It is metaphorical. It is symbolic. It is meaningful. It is emotional. The language of business, and especially the way marketing is going, tends to be very linear, logical, analytical, mathematical, mechanical, factual, and rational. So you got right. two different languages at play here. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. So to bring it back to golf... Like in a literal sense, 
St. Andrews. Let's use St. Andrews as our shared example. There are 7,305 yards of windswept links on the blustery North Sea coast. There's what? Um, on those 18 greens, that it's a par 72 layout, right? That's all the facts, right? What is it? Seven double greens, right? I think so, yeah. You yeah. got Hell's Bunker, the Road Hole, the Valley of Sin. Great. You, you've got all the particulars, right? Mm-hmm. But to the golfer worldwide, that's not a golf course. That that's that's Mecca, Bethlehem, and the Vatican all rolled up into one. Right. Right. That marvelous sandstone clubhouse and standing on Swilkin Bridge to take that iconic photograph. Like you're literally walking in the footsteps of old Tom Morris, young Tom Morris. Right? You, you can feel it, can't mm-hmm. you? Nicholas, Palmer, Tiger, Norman, Massey. <laughs> Right? Standing on the first tee, ready, ready to take a whack, right? It's where reality meets legacy on the fairway to heaven. Like right there, Scott. We're not talking golf anymore, are we? Right. So I like to say it's kind of like the subti- another subtitle of the book. Without the magic, it's just marketing. Mm-hmm. So to me, marketing is very functional. Is marketing a necessary component? The, the, our group yesterday called it, someone said, it's a necessary evil. Yes, no business, whether it's a golf course or not, can successfully survive without having marketing in place. But brand, in my opinion, is something equivalent to gravity. Gravity is invisible. You can't see it, but we're all bound by the forces of gravity. Well, I think your brand identity is kind of the same thing. It's intangible, it, but it guides all the major decisions. It guides the vision. It it guides everything, every part of your business, who you're going to hire, yeah. who are you going to partner with, who you're going to align with, um, you know, what kind of customers you're going to attract, all, all these different things. So it's a, it's a highly misunderstood concept, but uh, people tell us we've, they kind of like the way we see it in terms of it's not that complicated. Figure out your identity and then, Build a reputation. Don't put the cart before the horse. You bet. Could you kind of say it's the personality of your business? Like it's who you're being yeah. when you're doing what you're doing. Is that is that a good that's way to a, look that's at it? That's great. Yeah. In fact, in fact, I'll if you want to go on a deeper dive of what that is, and it, I don't want to go too deep because now we're really getting to, into the methodology and our enough. own version of the golf swing. Mm-hmm. But the secret, if everyone wants to hear the secret. It's, um, it's don't do it the way, like we operate off a completely different framework. So when we get invited by companies, organizations to help them figure this out once and for all, by the way, Canada's huggable car dealer. Do we ever have to change that, Scott? No. No. Who else did that? Nike. What were three words they came up with? Just do it. Do they ever have to change that? No, sir. There we go. It's the same thing. You only got two to six words to create an identity. Mm -hmm. That's what you have. Once you figure that out, then you can run all the Facebook ads you want or tweet all you want or whatever you want to build reputation. But it's right. Yeah. Now, I love your question because in the creation of identity, just like building a golf swing, what we do is we we completely change the operating system. And anyone who's got maybe a background in marketing or or learned marketing at a university will understand what I'm talking about with uh, the foundation of modern day marketing was actually established in 1955. Guy by the name of Neil Borden wrote an essay. And now the guy's from Harvard. So he's, you know, he just didn't fall off the turnip truck. He, right. he knew a few things. Yeah. But there was a major technological advancement in the 1950s that prompted Neil Borden to write a seminal essay called The Marketing Mix and his framework called The Four P's. Right. Probably the television, I'm guessing. I'm guessing it was television, too, because because when television came out, 
marketers, as you can imagine, if you, if, and that's why I love the study of legends and the study of history. Well, let's go back. How did they react? Well, television was such a new beast, right, Scott? Like, what, what do you do? Up until then, all you had to worry about was, you know, some newspaper and some magazines and the radio. That was yeah. it. Yeah. It was pretty easy. So you much know? easier to grab people's attention in oh, 1955 yeah. than it is today, right? And, and, and the yellow pages. I mean, everyone yeah. was in defined geographic markets. It, it's completely different. Yeah. So Borden writes the four Ps, and, and basically that became the foundation for, you know, and that, that begat things like target demographics and all, all kinds of things, right? Well, the more we looked at it, the more we thought, you know, that's God bless Neil Borden for what he created. But I, I, I'm going to argue and challenge. We, we live in a completely different world now that good for Neil Borden. He gave us a framework that could last, you know, six, seven decades or so, but what's the framework now? And part of your question led into the frame. What if the framework comes from the fact that because uh, I'm always interested in what's not going to change and what's not going to change, no matter how much technology advances, no matter whether this AI thing gets really rolling in ways we don't even know. But no matter what, the one thing that's never going to change, there's a few things, but one thing is that humans will always be intrigued and interested and relate to stories and storytelling. And we discovered a framework many years ago. See, I wrote about it in chapter three, right? Christopher Booker is a guy from the United Kingdom who spent nearly four decades researching the origin of stories. So instead of the four Ps, we look at the seven basic plots. There's only mm -hmm. seven basic types of stories. And this was the Pan, not a pan, well, yeah, let's call it the Pandora's box or whatever. It opened it up to where could we go with storytelling and could we incorporate personality and character techniques from Hollywood? How about that, Scott? Yeah. How do they create Hollywood characters? Could we take elements of, of the greatest storytellers of all time from literature and, and the movies you know, whether it's Moneyball, whether it's uh, Casablanca, wouldn't matter what the movie is, right? And could we create an operational framework from that? What we discovered is that if you change the framework, the operating system, you change the outcome. Yeah, and I guess, I guess where this all kind of leads to is the fact that a lot of our buying decisions are made emotionally, as yeah. opposed to maybe logically. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I heard you, you know, reference, you know, things with regards to the car business and, you know, 0.9% financing, and we've got the best service and the best selection and the best serve, you know, whatever it is. Right. But better but really, quality, better selection, better service, better every, value. but everybody can say that. Right. And, and sure. so, you know, the, the stories connect to the emotional part of our decision-making and, and that's obviously, I think where, this goes and why it works, correct? Right. So what's the equivalent in the golf industry? In the sense of... Uh, what's like, the marketing language of the golf industry? Here's what I'm going to challenge. Yeah. Anyone from the golf industry listening, go to your websites, but only... But no, sorry. Go to your competitors' websites. Study four, five, six competitors' websites. It's probably a lot of things like, you know, we've got the best service and the best screens and the, you know, the, the best price. It's all these things that everybody can do, right? Everybody can do. And everyone's going to have pretty pictures. Yeah. Aren't for they? Sure. For sure. Hopefully. For sure. <laughs> right. Sometimes what they no don't. But... What no one's going to do is dig in and figure out, well, wait a second, where's the untold story in all of this? Yeah. Because if I can figure out the untold story... Now I'm not talking about my, you know, uh, luxurious or what is it? The, my, my, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, magnificent par 71 layout and 6,852 yeah. manicured. I was searching for the word yeah. well, well manicured, manicured sure. right? All the greens are well manicured mm -hmm. our friendly hospitality staff, right? Like, yeah. 
it's all going to be a wash, isn't it, Scott? Yes, absolutely. Right. Our experience would dictate that there's an untold story somewhere. We don't know where it is yet. Just got to find it. We'll get back to our conversation in a moment. But first, are you ready to learn from the world's greatest golf and hospitality industry leaders? Train your team and grow your business with a membership to Golf Industry Guru. Join for less than $3 per day and give your entire team access to over 150 hours of courses, podcasts, webinars, templates, articles, live Q&A calls, and more. Free content samples and registration details at golfindustryguru.com. Um, we'll talk about how to do that, I think in a little while here, but in the book, there's so many great examples of businesses that, um, have become big little legends. And so I was just hoping maybe you could share with the audience, uh, one of those businesses that you think would relate to, you know, golf course owners and operators. It could be St. Andrews. It could be one of the other ones that maybe lives in the hospitality space, but just maybe so that people can wrap their heads around a little bit, how this can happen how yeah. you can become a big little legend. Maybe just, just tell the abbreviated version of uh, one of the stories of one of the businesses that's featured in the book. Well, and here's something that's top of mind. Like we were talking, like we went to Florida for the holidays and, and uh, you know, there's obviously there's, there's a lot of golf down in Florida, but let's, mm-hmm. let's pull one that was featured in chapter five and chapter eight. Okay. Um, and there's a principle at play. So I'm going to speak to the principle and then get into the more tactical application, but it's Perfect. it's very it's very high level. Okay, you're a media company first. You're a golf course second. You're a you're in the media business. Okay, you're not in the golf business anymore. Well, you are, but the, you see, you're a media company that happens to sell tee off times mm-hmm. or lessons or swag at the pro shop or equipment right but you're in the media business okay okay mhm this strategy is uh, we talk about it in chapter 9 in my view red bull is the best in the world at it they're a media company and they happen to sell what a sports drink an energy drink energy drink does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. If anyone listening, you just go to the Red Bull YouTube channel. And in chapter nine, we actually, and you know, because you read the book, Scott, you know, we we can pinpoint the day they created that at the Monaco Grand Prix many years ago <laughs> with a magazine of all things. And yeah. then that, that was the aha. Wait a second. We're in the wrong. We're in a bigger business. Yeah. Okay. So let's go small scale. Okay. Enter- entertainment and sports. Featured in the book, so it'll be more relevant to anyone listening. Are you familiar with the latest on the Savannah Bananas, Scott? Well, I don't know about the latest. I mean, I definitely remember them from the book and some of the outlandish things they're doing. I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, but definitely dive deeper there. I'm excited to hear about it. Uh, Yeah, well, this is the latest. Okay. Okay. So to put it in context, the Savannah Bananas are certainly not a major league team out of Georgia. Scott, they're not even a triple A team, a double A team, or a single A team. Scott, do you remember how far down the ladder they are? They are way down there. We're way they're at the bottom of the bottom. Yeah. Okay. But the baseball doesn't matter. Jesse Cole, I believe, and I'm shouting and screaming this as much as I can for everyone. I think one of the true marketing geniuses in North America right now is Jesse Cole Very because cool. he's running a media company that happens to be a minor league baseball team. Yeah. Yeah. Again, go to the YouTube channel. YouTube, by the way, is the sleeping giant of the whole thing. Once you get your identity figured out, YouTube is monstrous of what it can do. So I'm giving clues here throughout our conversation. 
people have got to study the Savannah Bananas and don't get caught up in it's it's baseball's version of the Harlem Globetrotters and their zany to you use the word outlandish. Yeah, the guy wears a top hat and yellow tuxedo seven days a week. He never okay. But here's the point. I just found out the other day. I got a friend who wants to go see the Savannah Bananas are going on this world tour. Uh, a friend of mine the other day uh, that I had breakfast with in Florida wants to go see them in Palm Beach, Florida, February 17th. Like anyone can look this up, right, Scott? He tro- he goes online to try and apply for tickets, get tickets. Sold out. Ask me how long the waiting list is for the Savannah Bananas. It's got to be months. 250,000 people are on their waiting list and oh they've kept it. And the, and the stadium probably holds 5,000 people. If that, well, they're touring, they're touring different stadiums around okay. the country. Yeah. Okay. But my point is, I don't think there's a major league baseball team with 250,000 people on their waiting list. Do you? Yeah. No, definitely not. No. So what's the equivalent to golf? It's like for St. Andrews or what do you got to do? Book a tee time. What? year in advance. Yeah. The secret is to create the brand that is so irresistibly magnetic, right? That, that why do people line up? Like, why are they lining up at that Swilkin bridge for that photograph? Why? If you're a golf course uh, owner, you're a, you're, you're a high level executive you got to start thinking really hard about well, how are we going to create the lineup, right? And and part of that is is the deeper understanding. You can't create the legend. See, they they line up for legends, don't they, Scott? Mm-hmm. They always do, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't create the legend without a story. And when you uncover the untold story, that's how you can build your identity, build your reputation. It's a hey. It's a long-term play. And this kind of ties into your term, attention is currency. Yes. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that for us and and what all that means? So Jesse Cole and the Savannah Bananas, are they getting attention? They sure are. Yeah. They sure are. Right. No one would have even heard of them two years ago. Wouldn't matter what business audience, because I get lots of invitations to speak. Doesn't matter. Like right now, Scott, if I ask 20 people, let's say there's 20 people in a in a conference room, conference center, small business group, or, or senior executives, out of 20, I can guarantee right now, eight or nine have heard of the Savannah Bananas. That's unthinkable two years ago. So they're getting attention. Mm-hmm. They understand. Because once you have their attention, then you can make a connection, make a connection, build a relationship, build a relationship. You build trust. If you earn their trust, you earn their business. Now, let's flip it all the way over back to the old course. Have you ever been, by the way? I haven't, no. Okay. I want you to picture what goes on every day, every single day. So when, you know, when they release a brand new iPhone for Apple, what happens, Scott? There's a new phone out. Suddenly what happens? People camp out to get their hands on it. Exactly. How, we were at Disney over the holidays. 57,000 people a day are visiting that magical world, that magic kingdom. Okay, great. They're lining up in Paris for that painting that we can't talk about, but they all, they, they're lining up. All right. Yeah. At Swilkin Bridge. Every day you can set your watch to it. I saw it in 2016. I saw it again the next year in 2017. I went on back-to-back speaking tours in the United Kingdom, and I saw there's a long lineup of non-golfers. They don't even play the sport. They're lining up 10, 20, 30 people, Scott. On that road, there's a road that goes by 18. So the foursome plays, the, the, the foursome will hit their tee shot, approach Swilkin Bridge. They will take their photographs, and then they go on. Next, tourists, snap, snap, snap. Amazing. So Amazing, right? But So here's the connection. Attention equals currency. People will wonder. 
I get this all the time. Where's the ROI? You know, how do you, how do you justify the ROI? How do you measure it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's how you measure it. Do you think, Scott, for a minute, that there is correlation between that lineup for those photo ops from non-golfers to the amount of merchandise that's being sold in the gift shops throughout St. Andrews, Scotland, town of 11,000 people. What do you think? Yeah, there must be, for sure. Of course. Do you think there's any relationship between that lineup for those photo ops and I think it's more than 10 million pounds of official merchandise being sold through the St. Andrews Lynx Trust? What do you think? Of course. Of course. Attention equals currency, which means... Any business leader today has got to be asking the question, how are we going to inspire people to pay attention to us? That's the the dynamics have totally changed. And that's why I think the work that you folks are doing is so good, because I think what you're doing is helping, you know, people in the golf industry understand it's, it's not about just throwing out a par 72 layout and sitting there and waiting for the customer to show up. There's little, there's many little things that have to happen, right? There's a thousand and one different things that have to happen. But one of the big strategic things is how are we actually going to earn the attention that I call it uh, that lineup at St. Andrews before I forget, Scott, I call it, uh, I came up with a, a new acronym, CSM. Okay. Common sense measurement. Yeah. Yeah. What, what would happen, Scott, if someone came along some real left brain analytical engineering type looked at that Swoken Bridge and said, "Well, that bridge, you know, it's it's time. It's it's got to <laughs> yeah. go. It's uh, you know, let's uh, let's uh, let's you know, blow that thing up. We're going to put this nice new thing, aren't we, Scott? Yeah, be much safer. Yeah. <laughs> much safer. It'll be we we'll be able to if we want to move to carts, we'll be able to drive yeah. carts across. What do you think would happen? You're be like, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous." Right. So from th- this is brand this is high level brand strategy. You remove even one brick from that 700-year-old Swilkin bridge, it's like it's like you just kill Bambi. Yeah. Like if Disney taught us anything about storytelling, don't kill Bambi. That's right. Right? So like I say, going back to the huggable car dealer, like we got teddy bears for a reason, right? They're part of the story. And the story isn't just how you tell it with words. It's how you tell it in chapter eight. I talk about right symbols and rituals and all the different things that are involved in the telling of the story. But but that's, you know, uh, essentially it is that I, I think people who are truly curious and I've always I've said for a long time. The the framework for big little legends from a leadership point of view. And it is about leaders. It's how everyday leaders build irresistible brands, right? Scott, it's not how marketing consultants build irresistible brands. It's right. It's not, and it's not big little average. So it's, it's a higher standard. It is about leadership. And we've seen over the years, the qualities, the there's four leadership qualities that are absolutely unmistakable. They're common to everyone. It's curiosity, courage, vision, and initiative. I love that. And you can't be both curious and skeptical at the same time. One of the things I'm thinking about too is as you start to uncover what your story might be, you've got to be able to do it in an authentic way, right? Because whatever that story is, you're going to have to be able to live it and breathe it day in and day out so that it's genuine. Um, Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you think that relates to what we're talking about today? Well, you just brought up chapter 12 and I will divulge a little out of chapter 12. Okay. Yeah. And golf, it comes full circle. The sport that I had a love hate relationship with provided the answer. And it was in 2016 and it wasn't right away. I'm not going to, but the the door opened the tiniest crack as I'm walking around St. Andrews the first time. And I'm really literally walking in my father's footsteps, trying to picture him as a, as a, as a little boy and, 
young, you know, teenager, young man, what, what's, what's going through his mind, right? And I got this real appreciation for the sport, and I got curious about it. And, well, I, and on a personal level, I kind of made a promise to myself, I'm going to make sure, because Dad was getting on in age at the time, and I'm going to make a promise to myself, I'm going to go back at least once a year to the Maritimes, eastern part of Canada, and tee it up. He and I are going to tee it up together just at least one round. Like, I'll never forget, he was 77. He shot 75 that day. Right? Awesome. That's was, Right. Okay. But but I just started to appreciate it. And then when the pandemic hit, Scott, remember we were all quarantined. I mean, do you, do you remember the panic and the – I mean, it was – it was real, man. Mm -hmm. it, it was very real. Well, I'm based in London, Ontario at the time, and I had a golf course five minutes away from my front door, the Fanshaw Park golf, uh, golf course, with a little nine-hole pitch and putt. My short game was always my Achilles heel. And I, since I can't travel and I got to get out of the house just for some fresh air, I got addicted to going to the little pitch and putt. And I got addicted. I'm going to hit just like that. I'm going to really, like, I'll hit 50 balls just from 20 yards off the fringe of the green. Right, Scott? Mm -hmm. Just the it, repetition. You can yep. feel it, right? Yep. yep. You feel it. And I got fascinated by golf history. I wanted to know more about Mo Norman. And then, you know what hit me one day is I'm, I'm, tr I'm finishing Chapter 12 of the book. And I realized it's the, le uh, just in the writing I'm tr I'm trying to write like a golfer would practice on the range or out of the trap or uh, that's how I try and write now. Okay. Okay. All right. Legend of Bagger Vance. That's where it all comes from. The authentic swing. Right. The great author, Stephen Pressfield, brought up the concept of the authentic swing. No two snowflakes are the same. The authentic swing, no two golf swings are the same. They're as unique as a thumbprint or a signature. I went, that's the metaphor. Everyone's got an authentic swing. Right. Authentic story. But not, not just in golf. It's an authentic story. And that's when I had that like epiphany of, well, what's mine? I'm the kid who fell in love with history books when I was a little kid. I was, besides being sports obsessed, I was also book, I was a book nerd, a bookworm. I was mm -hmm. a real nerdy kid in terms of, I, I wanted to understand everything about sports history and military history. I got really addicted to that stuff. So, it, you know, many years later, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. The, the kid who loves history and still to this day, like I just watch documentary after documentary after documentary, right? Yeah. Don't give me Harry Potter and fantasy. Give me Ken Burns. I hear you. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. But you see where the – so the connection between history and legends now, okay, that makes sense. Jim Gilbert, already this nice, quiet, kind, generous guy, the huggable car dealer. That's his – that's him. That's his authentic that's swing. His authentic swing. You right. know, when you're in your authentic swing – and living your story, and that's the trifecta, the holy trinity. Can you discover, tell, and live your own story that only you can claim? Because if you know, it's the it's been called the greatest story you've ever known, and it's your own. And and that's you know, for some people that that's a challenge. For others, they say, you know what, I'll face the challenge head on. I'll dive into this book, I'll start to think about things that, wait a second, that have nothing to do with the features, advantages, benefits, that have nothing to do with SEO and, yeah. like, right? And all the all other those analytical things, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. All the, the data obsessed stuff that everyone's doing anyway. Everyone's trying to outdata everyone else, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. This is a completely different way of looking at it. Get the identity figured out, then build reputation. But identity, yeah. to your point, comes from... And golf's the inspiration for it, right? Like, it made sense to me. Totally. Anyone can now go back and watch that movie or read that novel, couldn't they, Scott? Mm -hmm. And say, wait a second, I can see it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we talked about this famous painting. And yes. so there's a concept in the book. If you, if you don't know what we're talking about, folks, we're talking about the Mona Lisa. There's a, there's a concept in the book called the Mona Lisa effect. Can you just talk a little bit about that and yeah. how that connects to everything that we've been chatting about so far? Yeah, it's the, the Mona Lisa effect is the, the metaphorical description for the long lineup that almost exists by magic, but it doesn't. Uh, right? right? Like no one can explain it. If you ask where did it all come from and how did they create the Mona Lisa effect where, you know, they're lined up uh, like, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the Louvre, but there's 35,000 paintings, artifacts and objects on display at any one time. Well, yeah. 99% of the audience it's ignores <laughs> far more majestic paintings and it's, it's mob rules yeah. just to try and see this little 30 by 21 thing. Well, right. that's the same. The Mona Lisa effect describes, well, that's the same crush of spectators that are also lining up for the Apple phone or going to Disney or going to Weber's hamburgers, word of mouth, heaven on highway 11, five miles North of Aurelia, Ontario. It's the thousands of visitors who uh, frequent Pike place fish market in Seattle, Washington, or the swarms of customers at cafe Dumont in new Orleans, Louisiana. Like what, where do these lineups come from? Yeah. And, and and Dollar Shave Club, when they broke the internet uh, back in March 6, 2012, and, 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 and wound up, you know, going from startup to a billion dollar buyout in five short years. Amazing. Jesse Cole has created the Mona Lisa effect with the Savannah Bananas, right? I mean, Jim Gilbert, I'll never forget the day, Jim and Donna Gilbert, when they celebrated their 40th anniversary in Fredericton, New Brunswick, 2,000 people came out, Scott, lining up to shake their hand and have a hot dog and an ice cream and give them a hug. So we wanted to, to give people something that they could, you know, anchor the concept. Hey, there's this lineup and there's got to be some explanation for it. Why does it exist? And for St. Andrew, Scotland, as you know, in chapter 12, we pinpointed the exact day when they too created the Mona Lisa effect um, and made the world come to them. And how did, how did that happen? July 9th, 1960. I love that story. Can you share it with us? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good golf story. I won't keep you in suspense. Um. After World War II, no one's going across the Atlantic Ocean to play golf, are they? Right. No, no. And um, this story had a lot of meaning for me because of the, obviously, my dad's connection. But dad, to, to be perfectly clear, my father never told me this story. He, he's, And to this day, I don't know that he's totally aware of it. Okay, so dad's. 83 now, his his health is becoming a bit of an issue, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So when I started to piece it together, I said, well, wait a second. And I asked him one day many years ago, you know, about St. Andrews, and there was, there was no lineups. And Dad left in 57. There was one pivotal moment that totally changed everything. One guy out of Pennsylvania, decided to do something that nobody else. What did we talk? What were those four leadership things? I said there's four qualities of leadership to the whole thing. Curiosity, courage, vision, yep. initiative. Mm -hmm. One guy sees the whole thing differently. He had vision. And he realized golf at the time, think about the late 1950s, Scott, was golf an elitist sport? Yes, Absolutely. Unfortunately. It was definitely not mainstream. Yeah. Right? One guy knew the sport had to grow. It had to get bigger. And there were many challenges to do that. But he decided at a time when nobody else was going to do this, he's going to go. He's a professional. He, he realized 
The professionals had an opportunity to be the rising tide that would lift all boats. Great. How are we going to do that? You ready for it? We're going to create the Grand Slam. But not the Grand Slam won by Bobby Jones in 1930. This will be the professional Grand Slam. This will be the Masters. It'll be the PGA. It'll be the U.S. Open and the British Open. But no one's going over to the British Open. Why? It's expensive. It's a long flight. It's there's no prize money to speak of. Like right. they're going right, Scott. It, no American pro is going over. But one guy decided to. One guy thought there was incredible value in the birthplace of golf, the origins, what Bobby Jones did in 1930. Let's build on that and let's create a grand slam. And the only way to make it legitimate in the minds of the public was for this one golfer to go across the Atlantic and actually compete. And on July 9th, 1960, on the final round, he was down, I think it was four or five shots coming into the last nine. He had this gallant comeback. He's coming back. He's birdieing left, right, and center. He's got an army of followers behind him. And he falls just one stroke short, but his swagger and go for broke style captured the imagination of the sporting public and all of the world's press. Who are we talking about? Mr. Palmer? Uh, the King. Yeah. King put St. Andrews on the map by telling the story that was already there. Right. That's in, that, that's important. It's the same process, Scott. The story was already there. It needed someone to tell that story, to be the catalyst for that story. What happened after Arnold Palmer finished second at 1960 at the British Open? Then what happened? Prize money. It, oh, by the way, it was also captured on television, wasn't right. it? Right. And suddenly the world became fascinated by the origin of sport. Of, of golf, the, the, tr the rich tradition, old Tom Morris, young Tom Morris. Now who's coming over? Nicholas is coming over and Gary player from South Africa and Trevino's coming over who, who, and then who you see where this goes? Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, it's important for the audience to understand that, you know, obviously our clubs aren't St. Andrews and, you know, we might not be the Louvre where the Mona Lisa gets stolen, but there's also a lot of great examples in the book of businesses that are, you know, small to medium size that are very relatable to golf clubs. Um, you know, we've talked about our friend Barb Stegman and the seven virtues. Uh, no doubt. I'm sure there's, uh, people in the audience that are going to know the burger place that you talked about near, uh, is it Aurelia, Ontario? Yeah. You said, yeah. yeah. So, you know, don't think just because you're not St. Andrews, you're not the Louvre that, uh, there's nothing here for you. Cause there's so many great examples that are so relatable to what we do as club managers day in and day out. Yeah, every just like every club, let's make it specific to golf, right? Every club has a story. For sure. But you've got to dig deeper into finding in the like in the rich dusty archives of the past, there's going to be a story that ultimately will be based on human values. The St. Andrew's story is based on history and tradition and heritage, right? It's a Really, when he gets down to it, it's it's a heritage stiff. Uh, it's a heritage story that celebrate you know all about with dignity, honor, respect for the game, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, and it's told in their way. Augusta National tells it a little bit differently, I would say. Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't care the size of the club that we're that the that's listening today. Someone's got to have a story worth telling if you really think about, you know, what it is you could build it around. And and ultimately, that's going to, and that goes back to what were those leadership qualities? First and foremost is curiosity. And, 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 and in that spirit, I, I believe, you know, wisdom stands on the shoulders of wonder 
and imagination has no age and, and, and great ideas always came from having curiosity. Yeah. And, well said. And pe- people who are genuinely curious will start to figure something out here that, and, 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 and allow them and their club to develop their own authentic swing a la Bagger Vance. I love that. We, uh, we've been talking about Mr. Palmer and I know you were in Orlando not too long ago. I see the logo on your shirt. Uh, you'd said before we started this, that there was a story that you might want to share with oh, me. And I hope, yeah. I hope it ties into everything we're talking about here. I'm, I'm going on a bit of a limb, but, uh, yeah. share the story with our audience as well. And, and, uh, uh I'm looking yeah, forward to hearing it. Can you visually it. describe the logo? If uh, anyone listening to can also look it up, right? The Arnold yeah. Palmer logo. It's what it's that it's well, that there's the umbrella. the umbrella and it's multicolored. And I think there's green and yellow and orange in it. Right. So I'm, I'm looking now. Right. Yeah. So I had to buy, I had to buy the swag. And by the way, I went to Bay Hill not to play because you can't get on the course short notice. Um, I went because I wanted to feel, I wanted to understand that a deeper level, kind of like, you know, what was it about Arnold Palmer? And I talked to a number of people, like long term employees, okay, who have been working there, who knew him very well. Like Ernie would get out every morning. And, and, and after breakfast, he'd he'd go and hang out at the club. Very cool. And hang with the guys at the caddy shack. He'd go out with the maintenance guys. Like he was, he was that guy, right? But the logo, let's talk about the logo. The logo's got that umbrella with the green and the white and, and, and the yellow and the red. And then it's got the, the stick of the umbrella. Mm Mm-hmm. The guy at the caddy shack, his name was Phil. Phil tell uh, uh, Phil. Phil says he says, "You know why that that logo is the way it is?" I said, "No." He says, "Because the stick of the umbrella points to the heart. Everything here is about the heart." Cool. Yeah, everything was designed. That's epic. I love that. Very cool. Uh, er- everything from Arnold Palmer, his belief was. It all came from the heart. And certainly, I think that's a big part of his legacy. When you look at yeah, for sure. his philanthropy yep. and how much out of his way he went to really build this sport. And um, and I think I got chills when I heard when Phil told me that story. It's like, wow. Yeah. But that's it, isn't it? It's If it's not from the heart, if it's not genuine you're not going to be able to create anything magical out of it. No, absolutely. Um, and you just think like there, there's so much authentic, authentic. There's so much, auth- yeah, everything about that is authentic just because, you know, we know, we think we know what Arnold was all about and, and there's certainly a correlation there. So what a great story. That That's awesome. I love that. Um, as we get close to wrapping up here, um, any tips or other words of wisdom you might want to share with, club managers out there as they start working towards creating their big little legend? Yeah, I'm not, I, I don't want to be, I, it's a great question. I'm going to answer instinctively and intuitively as, as I know you would want me to be. I don't want to be like the shameless self promoter, but that's one of the reasons why the book was written. Like the book's Absolutely. four years of writing and research. Mm-hmm. Like your your own understanding, Scott, because you read the book is much deeper than when you started, right? Hundred percent. And and we're getting emails all the time now from people, complete strangers, different parts of the world, saying this. And it took you know four years of writing and research. So I'd start with the book. Uh, I and if reading's not your thing, it's on Audible. Yes. Like at our website, uh, GaryMaxwell dot com, we have an ongoing series called leaders and legends it's kind of like our own little netflix style series and 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 so anyone who's really intrigued i think you got to start with the mindset of uh, the beginner's mindset you got to be the student and just you know really start to absorb this and understand there's a different way to do it um uh, i'll give you a real good tip that's cut way way out of left field Hit me. I tell people this all the time. Watch Moneyball again. Great movie. Because Moneyball is not a baseball movie. 
Moneyball is a movie about challenging the status quo. Moneyball is a leadership movie. Moneyball is refusing to do what everyone else is doing in your industry. Mm -hmm. That's that's what Moneyball to me is really all about. And and so that's what I think if you swapped out baseball in your imagination and put in marketing, Moneyball makes a lot of sense. Awesome. I love that. Very cool. Uh, so as we conclude here, maybe just one more time, tell us about the book, the name of the book, where people can find it. Yeah. Uh, and if they want to connect with you personally, how do they do that? Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Big Little Legends. Uh, it's all over the world on Amazon and other fine book providers. Uh, it's available on Audible. Uh, BigLittleLegends.com. GareMaxwell.com. G-A-I-R. Uh, our YouTube channel. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. YouTube is the sleeping giant. And... Um, uh, I, I, you know, and I know you want to be as tactical as you can as well, and we both do to help people, but it, it does begin with you don't need a marketing plan as much as you need an attention plan. And the attention economy, what are we going to do to actually create attention for ourselves? Great. Well, that's going to always start with a, so that's number one. There's four things right away. We need an attention plan. We need a clearly defined story that's ours. And that's going to take some reflection and contemplation, right? And then it's the, okay, once we have that identity piece figured out, now we start to build our media company. And what's that media company going to be driven by? Video, video, video. Video is king, queen, prince, princess of the whole empire right now. And and so whether it's Jesse Cole or whether it's St. Andrews, if another very active YouTube channel, right? Like these are the things that are being done now as more and more organizations are figuring out they are the media. There are no intermediaries. The The Internet is, and social media has killed all that. So this is very high level strategy. There is a learning curve but hopefully with podcasts like this, Scott, and great guys like you, hopefully we're, you know, together somehow shortening the learning curve and figuring out Absolutely. how people can actually step into their own authentic swing and discover their true self, their their true identity. No, well said, well said. Well, listen, Gareth, thank you so much for your time today. It has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I hope that our audience enjoyed it as much as I did. So many great takeaways, so many little nuggets that uh, I think our audience can take back uh, and start uh, thinking about as they work to improve their business as we head towards the 2023 golf season in North America here. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. And uh, as we like to say here at Golf Industry Guru, we will see you on the inside. Thanks for listening to The Gig Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and mostly that you learned a few things that will help you improve your business. Join us next time as we continue to bring you the best and brightest golf and hospitality leaders on the planet. Thanks for listening.